So today's webinar is the, in the What Now? Marketing Disposition and Other Strategies to, to Dispose of NSP Inventory series, and we'll be examining land banking. What happened there? Sorry about that. Here's to be here. There we go. My apologies. So the, the webinar is designed for grantees who run land banks, conduct land banking, or are interested in transitioning properties to land banks. The presenter will cover the keys to a successful land bank, including holding and maintenance, innovative interim uses, and NSP-eligible end uses. In addition, marketing and disposition strategies will be covered in connection with uh, previous webinars in this series. And the Cuyahoga County Land Revitalization Corporation's land bank will also be featured as a case study. And uh, let me bring Walter Howell to the mic to uh, discuss the series. Hi, Walter. Hi, Kent. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're glad uh, that you're participating in the third uh, webinar in our series of, of four on disposition strategies. Um, if you've missed the previous two on marketing and disposition and scattered site rental, uh, there the materials are up on the NSP Resource Exchange, and uh, the materials for this webinar will be up uh, shortly. Um, so we we hope that you've enjoyed this this new uh, this new series, and and also please join us for uh, the finale, the grand finale, uh, webinar number four coming up next week. Uh, so it will be next Tuesday, 2 to 4 p.m., and it will be a best practices peer-to-peer -peer and expert roundtable. And we'll be talking about uh, these same topics on disposition, marketing, scatter site, land banking, financing, and uh, we hope you can if you can join us for that. I also wanted to uh, uh, let people know that uh, there's going to be eight uh, NSP problem-solving clinics uh, coming up in the spring and summer. Um, for grantees and your partners. Uh, the first one is April 24th and 25th, so just two weeks away in Stockton, California. So any grantees in, in this area, we encourage you to register online. There's also a listserv email out to uh, give you the registration information, and you can register up to 10 of your uh, grantees, staff, and partners for that. And uh, each workshop is going to have two uh, – each uh, clinic is going to have uh, – two tracks of workshop, one for new and old grantees, and also some one-on-one -on -one expert uh, consultation sessions. So hope to get you guys some one-on-one -on -one today at these clinics. And one of the uh, workshops at the training will be on disposition strategies. So if you want to dive deeper in any of these topics in this webinar series, uh, you can attend one any number of the eight clinics, and you can see their locations and tentative dates on NSP Resource Exchange. So uh, with, uh, we'll turn turn it over to start the land banking uh, presentation. Thank you, Walter. And uh, we've got a number of people with us today. Uh, as you can see in the panelist list, um, we've got uh, Michael Freeman, who is the Program Director for Capacity Building with the Center for Community Progress. And he joins us from Flint, Michigan. Uh, Matthew Dez the program officer at uh, Enterprise Community Partners, uh, who is focused heavily on NSP. He's based in Washington, D.C. Uh, Bill Whitney is the chief operating officer for the Cuyahoga County Land Reutilization Corporation, also known as the Cuyahoga Land Bank. And uh, Bill joins us from my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio. And we've got some uh, the folks you are used to hearing today, I think uh, we have uh, all three of, of uh, John Laswick, uh, Devio Guerra, and Hunter Kurtz, I believe, um, under the name of John Laswick in the panelist list. So um, welcome to our HUD reps from headquarters in Washington. And uh, we also have, uh, not listed here, but also in the panelist list, um, Kim Graziani from the Center for Community Progress and Mike Schramm from the Cuyahoga Land Bank, who will uh, not be part of the formal presentation but are available um, during Q&A sessions to uh, help us with our understanding of this land banking process. So with that, uh, let me 
turn this over to Michael Freeman for the Center for Community Progress. Hi, Michael. How are you doing? Turn okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, with just a common definition of a land bank and what a land bank is for the NSP program. A land bank is a governmental or non-governmental nonprofit entity established, at least in part, to assemble, temporarily manage, and dispose of vacant land for the purpose of stabilizing neighborhoods and encouraging reuse or redevelopment of urban property. And land banks are also considered subrecipients. Um, the difference between um, land banking and land banks, um, there is no difference for land banking activities specific to the NSP program. However, land banks really vary greatly um, depending upon where you're located. Uh, some states within the country that uh, have ordinance or legislation that backs the creation of formal land banks, which are typically quasi-governmental entities. Uh, they also have nonprofit organizations and other entities, um, even governmental entities, do land banking activity without being really formalized land banks. So, but um, the prescription by NSP for land banking activities is really the same for everybody, even though the entity or the conduit for the land banking may differ throughout the country. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> what is a land bank? If a land bank is a government, governmental entity, it may maintain a foreclosed property that it does not own, provided it charges the owner of the property the full cost of the services uh, or service or places a lien on the property for the full cost of the service. You can, um, lambs actually are structured to land bank on behalf of other entities, but for the NSP program, for-profit entities are excluded from uh, NSP-assisted land banking activities. Um, so <clears throat> essentially, when you land bank on behalf of what the nonprofit, such as, like, let's say, if it's Habitat for Humanity, if it's a foreclosed prof property um, that was received as a donation, it can be land banked. However, once it's been discharged from the land bank, either the full cost of service has to be reimbursed or that lien has to be placed on the property, which provides for uh, the eligible end use requirement to be fulfilled within the process. Elements of an effective land bank. Um, land connected to the tax for co or collection and foreclosure process. Um, this is where governmentally, legislatively, created by ordinance, they uh, are connected to absorbing these properties, bring them back into productive use, um, and specifically, you know, I guess they absorb other properties other than foreclosed, but when it's NSP tied to NSP, um, these must be foreclosed properties. Um, land banks are scaled at the metropolitan level or the most diverse real estate market possible. Uh, land banking is an excellent strategy at a local level as it fits well with areas of diverse markets and that properties require patient planning and diverse funding mechanisms. Um, that may be required to stabilize larger areas. Uh, they're policy-driven, they're transparent in their policies and transactions. All land banks and all land banking activity should be transparent in its policies and transactions. Uh, this is a general rule for land banks across the board, but this is even more critical as federal funding is being used on these properties. So essentially, when you acquire property, um, the maintenance of that property, uh, procurement associated with that maintenance, how it's disposed of, these things should be transparent documents which are provided to the locality and the citizens of the community as well. So it's, it seems a consistent, a fair, and an equal process. <clears throat> um, effective land banks market or work in markets that are targeted by the community for redevelopment. Um, they're effective through effectively channeling their resources. And targeted neighborhoods should be chosen uh, as the focus of property assembly so that you can maximize the impact. While there's the ability to acquire significant numbers of properties in the community, and maybe a, 
effective land bank would choose to look at specific areas of acquisition uh, so that what they're doing or the, the impact that they have in the community is actually measurable, it's visible, and it's relevant to the community that's being served. Um, effective land banks have an emphasis on community engagement and participation. Um, they work with the community and other stakeholders uh, at all points of their activity. It's, it's acquisition, it's management and maintenance, it's disposition. Uh, this is in order to land banks to identify tipping point properties. They have to know their community, know what the stakeholders uh, desire, what they would like to see. Um, stakeholders and other community member and participants can help design cost-effective and community-supported maintenance strategies, and they can ultimately help brainstorm disposition strategies that meet the best and highest use requirements of local residents and neighborhoods. So when we get the, the most effective land banks in the countries, these are the core kind of and, and fundamental values that are maintained in the way that they design their entire land banking program. I'll uh, switch this now over to Matt. Let me see. There? Um, yeah, sorry, I was just okay. waiting for the control the there. Uh, I'm going to go into a little bit more of uh, the land banking activities for NSP. Doing a little bit more uh, background here than the previous two sessions on marketing disposition. Partly we realize that this is somewhat of a new activity for a lot of the NSP grantees. Uh, so we do a little bit more background, some more relationship to the program as a, as a context. And this, this slide here on really land bank can do is part of that. And really I think the key takeaway uh, from that is that we're talking about a defined geographic area so that they overlap with the NSP target areas that uh, grantees have already defined. And banks will purchase, uh, main, and dispose. I think those are the three key activities that we're really talking about. And we'll get those a little bit more. The eligible use section here, uh, really to drive the home that we're talking about, uh, those properties here, and really talking about operating the land banks, these activities. So this slide is really just uh, a reiteration of, of such points, and again, the eligible activities are acquisition and dis disposition, and we're talking for properties, and really includes a lot of the associated activities, so due diligence on your purchase, uh, the purchase price itself, obviously, closing costs uh, of the purchase, that middle ground, which we'll get into a little bit more, the interim and the maintenance and management period between acquisition and disposition certainly part of land banking for NSP, and the, the back end on that disposition, the resale, uh, closing costs, and, and related costs for the disposition. So this is a graphic here that we put together uh, just to, to drive the point home a little bit more that we're talking again about three buckets of activities for an NSP land bank. We're talking about the acquisition, uh, working about the maintenance and holding period, and there are some interesting things that to consider at this point. We're going to talk about interim uses and, of course, a maximum 10-year holding period for NS properties. And the the bucket of of disposition, and when we're at this stage, we're really looking to meet an eligible end use, get to a national objective, and there are, there are different ways to do that. I want to point out that really critical to land banking, but also to the other NSP activities, uh, such as lab uh, and, and redevelopment, and site selection uh, and the property selection up front when you acquire the property is really the key, and it's going to drive how you can plan for that redevelopment, and it's also going to drive whether the disposition strategy is all successful. So it's a, a key to this, and again, as I said, other NSP activities are, are certainly much the same way. The pre selection is a, a really critical point. 
start sort of at the beginning of that life cycle, uh, some key provisions for NSP. So on the acquisition, um, much, and really this works the same way, uh, because we're working with foreclosed properties, when we're talking about NSP land banks, all supply uh, that would apply to other activities you're conducting uh, when you're purchasing foreclosed properties. So that includes the per discount requirement, uh, and also, and as I, I brought up already, the NSP target area is, is also going to be a key, and it's going to be some overlap, and perhaps the land bank is operating at a, a smaller scale than some of the target areas, but uh, obviously those are the areas you're going to look for for the properties. In acquisition, uh, there are a few key cutting federal requirements, them being Uniform Relocation Act. So Properties have to be vacant prior to entry uh, to a land bank, but necessarily at the acquisition. So you certainly need to consider URA, uh, which includes notices to the owner, or enter, notices to the tenants if, if there are tenants in the building, and then analysis uh, if, if there are occupants on services and, and payments may be necessary for relocation. I wanted to bring up uh, the tenant protections under the Recovery Act. So again, we're talking about foreclosed properties, and uh, foreclosed properties have been foreclosed on after February 17th of 2009, and which have uh, bona fide tenants subject to the, the Recovery Act tenant protection requirement. A uh, cross-cutting requirement, and uh, I'm sure everybody uh, is aware of this one, environmental review, of course, uh, prior to committing funds, prior to acquisition, is a requirement. And really, I think, more so than other activities, uh, a tier or a neighborhood target review is helpful uh, for banks and, and really to expedite the process for the environmental review. We're talking about uh, certain geographic areas and targeted geographic areas. So this is an opportunity to um, really to look at that area, especially if it has distinct and some or similar characteristics, I should say, and get at creating a tiered review uh, to help uh, really quicken that process to look really to site-specific review that's necessary once that tier one is complete. So with this slide, the assembling properties, uh, this is really intended to, to give a sense of how you put properties together into a land bank, uh, we're not directly acquiring, when you're not spending NSP dollars to directly acquire properties. There are a couple different ways that can happen. One of them is obviously demolition. Uh, you may have a situation where you could funds with a different entity to demolish uh, properties. This is to connect those activities to a land bank. Once, once the properties are demolished, the land bank, especially if there's no no clear immediate for reuse, and really the market doesn't justify uh, maybe a, a redevelopment, a quick redevelopment after a, a demolition. Another uh, a forced property donations uh, could be a deed in lieu transfer. And then, as was mentioned in the the, the stress of the effective uh, land bank characteristics, tax foreclosure is one where uh, especially if you're a local government and a land bank entity uh, really connecting into the ta tax collection and foreclosure process. So then are just, just some ways that uh, a land bank can assemble properties without uh, directly acquiring or spending money for acquisition. So to touch on uh, some of the end uses before we go on to some of the interim uses and, and, and what we can do there. And so we're looking at uh, three, I think, major categories for reuse and redevelopment. And the object objective here is, again, that all land bank properties have to meet a national objective with the end use. So development of housing, uh, for housing, side disposition, and for few one grantees that are able to do public facilities, uh, certainly an option for redevelopment. Our common strategies, uh, redevelopment for housing, uh, 
uh, is centered here. And so really one distinction I wanted to make was that we're talking about redevelopment. It's, it's not eligible UC activity. So it's not, for NSP purposes, a land banking activity. And that relates back to the definition that we talked about at the beginning. Uh, redevelopment, rehab, new construction, that wasn't part of what uh, he can do under land banking. So I just wanted to point out, I know there's been a little bit of um, misunderstanding or, or some confusion on that point. So for redevelopment, uh, we, we can talk about rental or ownership units, certainly depending on, on the market and, and what the needs are in your community. And very similar to uh, redevelopment under LUSE, all the same uh, prices and, and restrictions apply. So you'll need to think about the sale prices. Uh, the ownership units, lesser of fair market value or, or total development costs, and obviously the the big one meet the national objective. We're going to have uh, the affordability and the the either the tenant or the owner income certifications complete. Pause here uh, and see if there are any any questions before I pass back to to Michael to go into a little bit more of the uh, additional guidance related to, to bank activities and into some in, interim uses. We do have a question, and uh, let's go to David. I'll unmute you now. Hi, David. Hi. Um, yeah, well, my question was related to that previous slide where you said about um, public uses, and we have a killer land bank site that is in a plane, and we really can't use it for anything but public space. We're looking at doing a community garden on it. Uh, the one question we have is, do we, we need to convert that into activity E in order to, to transfer it to an entity or just be done under activity C, land banking um, activity? I'll start with that, and maybe uh, John or Davi can jump in. Uh, my first question would be or to ask if there are any costs or any additional activities associated with converting that, I think that'll be one of the considerations. Um, so certainly if, if you already have the property and it already meets the area benefit and the public facility requirements of CDBG, I know that there's a, a reason to convert that to a different activity uh, just, just to qualify the end use. But I'll let John and David jump in there. I agree with that. It's, uh, I mean, you sell it directly out of the land bank uh, equity there as disposition. Um, I think, did you say that was NSP1? Um, yes. Funds? Is this? Okay. We only purchased, we purchased that particular lot for a dollar. Uh -huh. Well, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> it's just that um, under E, in, L in NSP two and three, you can only redevelop for housing, so um, it's it's a little more restricted in that sense. But you could you could do what you're trying to do there to take a property out of the land bank and turn it into a a park, or community garden, or some other you know kind of neighborhood area benefit type activity. Um, and there's no there's no need to uh, sort of wash it through another uh, eligible use to to get there. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, David. And uh, at the moment, I see uh, no other questions, so I guess we can turn this over to Michael. Okay. So I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into um, basically end use uh, uh, activities and how you get there. Um, now let's see. There we go. All right. Um, for development of housing. We've we've already discussed that you've got really 10 years for compliance with this, but uh, a lot can change over 10 years, and budgets change, and um, you know your initial projections based on your initial analysis when you acquire the property. You just don't know. Um, many people. Uh, by the time that the properties are ready for redevelopment, may be using NSP program income, which is eligible both for rental financing, for home ownership financing, 
um, and making sure to respect the low-income set-aside requirements when using that program income. Um, however, there, in the absence of maybe your anticipated NSP program income, there are layers of financing that you can place into this project or your intended project. So maybe home funds, it could be low-income housing tax credits, brownfield incentives for rental housing, historic tax credits as well, um, and developer equity. There's a number of different financing instruments. The, the one caution, I guess, looking at the development of these properties and uh, is the if you are within a specific time frame to meet the eligible end use requirement, that the additional layering of financing can sometimes lengthen or complicate a project. Um, and also, using the NSP funding, you're required to meet either low income set aside or LMMH requirements. But if you introduce these other layers like home, or LIM housing tax credits, that you will actually have to obey the income requirements associated with those other funds. So that's one caution. Um, and then another caution may be with home funds, when initially, let's say you were to uh, land bank a unit, uh, it was vacant at time of um, acquisition, it was a foreclosed unit. Um, for this interim period, there's some lease arrangement associated with it, and the appropriate notifications were made to individuals who are leasing. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but uh, if you introduce home funds after the fact and you had not intended to use those, um, you, there may be some great implications associated with that. So um, um, it's always that caution of of being a little bit more intentional about what you're going to do with the project and how it's going to be used um, in absence of the crystal ball of knowing what's going to happen and with market conditions and what you may require. Um, Let me jump in for a second. This is sure. John Laswick. Uh, I, I think we said is accurate, but I don't think people should get the impression that uh, that a property has to has to be redeveloped according to the most restrictive requirements. Uh, it's uh, sometimes possible to do, uh, you know, a pro rata uh, uh, type of arrangement uh, or something like that. So it's not. There's, there's a little bit of flexibility there, and I just wanted to point that out. No, that's great input, actually. That's good to know. Moving forward. Okay. Uses for land bank properties. Um, uh, so in side lot dispositions, uh, when you're sending a vacant land, uh, land bank property uh, to an adjacent owner, um, they need to meet the NSP income requirements. Um, it, it's necessary as well when you have a side lot disposition program that you um, create policies which are transparent, fair, and consistent. Uh, that way, when people are acquiring these properties, um, it, it will know what they're going to encounter and that it is consistent for all, all people. Um, I think that's one of the biggest tripping points I've seen with a number of land banks is that they don't have solidified disposition guidelines and then th typically they are accused of favoritism or there must be something more to it. I, I think that's the biggest caution. Um, and if at the end of the presentation, we'll actually give you a resource that you can look at um, uh, that has on its website. It's a toolkit for land banking, which actually lays out policies and procedures and site lot programming. So there are tools that you can see where how, how things can be made consistent for the organization. Um, hold on. Let me just did a jump ahead. Yeah, I did. Hold on a second. No, I did. I mean, this is my first time using webinar, so please forgive. You're doing um, fine. <laughs> uh, so, end use of land bank properties. Um, NSP one only uh, is for public facilities, uh, and I think that's been covered somewhat. Um, mm -hmm. No, NSP 2 and 3 actually have to result in uh, housing or some residential application. 
Uh, for public facilities, they have to meet the CDBG public facility eligibility. Uh, so there's be um, community parks, recreational facilities, community gardens. Um, and so that I believe we've covered holding and maintenance. Um, now we talked about there's a 10 year maximum holding period. Banking is considered an interim use and it must be obligated for reuse or redevelopment within that 10 year period. Um, the NSP can pay for boarding, taxes, maintenance costs. Uh, it can be uh, it can be used to hold properties in a static condition, um, and all procurement requirements apply when using uh, NSP funds for boarding and maintenance, and that's by third party entities. And as well, there are toolbox documents established that show what these boarding and maintenance uh, RFPs will look like. Um, one thing about that we are constantly reminded of is that demolition itself is not an eligible end use during that 10 year period. So it does need to be brought to some conclusion. So, um, let me see. The, one of the issues I guess I was thinking about related to, let's say, payment of taxes is that um, when you think about your design for your, your holding instrument or your land bank um, about who it's comprised of and who is involved in that. With, let's say if a local unit of government um, is fiduciary for the NSP funding um, and they are also the tax collection unit, uh, one of the concerns would be is a governmental construct like it's the city that's doing the land banking and then ultimately uh, they, it may be perceived that the payment of taxes is just, uh, it's enriching the city. They're paying themselves effectively. So I look at this as, um, you know, let's say in uh, Michigan, we actually have county land banks, which are completely separate and distinct from local use of government. Uh, the, the city is actually the fiduciary for the grant funds. The land bank is a sub-recipient and they are able to pay those taxes as customary holding costs associated with those properties uh, because there is that arm's length and they are two distinct entities. And that if it is, um, let's say, a land bank instrument which is uh, heavily influenced or populated by city uh, representation, uh, would that then be considered uh, uh, the collection of taxes they're essentially paying themselves? And so it's just a reminder that when you're looking at these holding costs for the static condition of the property, that there should be that arm's length. And John, did I actually phrase that correctly? I just this can be a little bit sensitive, I guess. I think you're all right. Okay, that's good. Okay, um, reuse and redevelopment planning. Um, those again back to the initial slide where we talk about uh, when you're making your decisions on uh, what you're going to you're going to redevelop that property, how you're going to meet that eligible end use. Um, I guess while you're able to do it for a 10-year period, the comfort level for me, specifically as a consultant working with nonprofits or with land banking entities, is that um, don't get too comfortable with that amount of time that you do, you should hopefully reach something sooner and hopefully the 10 year is just your, uh, uh, your emergency threshold. Um, I've worked with a number of organizations who like to try and keep it within actually their grant period so that they're able to close out that grant. Um, you think essentially about how the, how the organization or your developing entity will pay for those costs. Let's say if you go past that three or your grant period, um, that you still have to keep a property in a static condition or something that doesn't degenerate and become uh, an adverse condition within your neighborhood. Uh, essentially, if you come to a point where, let's say, you're, you're done with your grant, you anticipate your end use happening. Um, you'll have tax collection during that period, perhaps. Uh, you will have 
maintenance costs. And so how exactly are you going to plan for that maintenance and care of that property until you've reached your uh, the end of the period? <clears throat> um, also, going back to that graphic we discussed um, where you acquired, what was your plan for to meet that eligible end use? And do you have contingency plans if the review if the plan that you initially had is no longer viable? Um, the, the smartest organizations I've worked with have looked at their plans and come up with a, a best case scenario and a worst case scenario. Looking at three different levels of how are we going to meet that eligible end use, the preferred one being maybe redevelopment. The second contingency would be um, are we able to move this property forward as a uh, as a site or third will they be able to identify a developer or uh, maybe a key development corporation or other partner that can help them meet that use um, so really being very aware in your planning process about the characteristics of the neighborhood and what kind of opportunities ultimately uh, you could be provided with. Having one egg in that basket could be a, a fairly risky scenario. Um, under testing interim uses, this is where maybe the presentation gets a little bit more interesting, I'm hoping. Um, <clears throat> that now, The actual interim use activities, I want to preface this, are probably not always uh, things that you can pay for uh, with the NSP program. Anything that may be beyond static maintenance and code-related activities are, may not be eligible for payment, but this is in thinking creatively about how to use these properties and to um, make sure that they're an asset for your neighborhood during that period that you're planning or you're putting everything together so you can meet your eligible end use. Um, uh, these are the strategies that we like to see uh, in banking organizations to think about. Um, so if there are mothballing buildings, which I, I think the mothballing approach can lead to me some community detriment. Uh, they can be, uh, be seen as just vacant, blighted properties, even if they're being kept clean and static. Um, such as risks like what happens if the building catches on fire? What happens if a person is hurt within the building? Um, and then vacant land. There again, if it's me, you have a plan to go in and just mow the property and keep it clean or free of debris. Uh, is this ultimately an interim use which is beneficial to that neighborhood? Um, so we have programs like, like, let's say, with the city of Flint has a clean and green program where they use vacant land for beautification projects, uh, community gardens. Now, these are even uh, properties that have been acquired and are being land banked under the NSP2 program. Now, they can't pay for any of the activities that happen on the property. These are typically done in partnership with uh, our, our uh, beautification groups, um, our collaboratives, people that come in and essentially adopt the property uh, uh, through maybe a more formalized process with the land bank um, where they're able to make sure that maintenance does take place or let's say if it's a clean and green initiative, uh, if it's an urban garden uh, where the property is environmentally clean, it's being made available to uh, uh, these gardening groups, <clears throat> um, that it's actually maintained and that there's uh, there's the ability to, uh, I guess, read that property if the the agreement isn't being met. Um, that's really that's something that they learned in, the, in their go around is that they had people that were very excited about adopting the lot or their own gardening, um, and uh, maybe things didn't work out terribly well. So they have these structured agreements which have been created and have gone past verbal commitment. Um, also notifying people that at any time the property may be recaptured before that adoption or lease period uh, expires. Um, if there's a development opportunity that comes up before 
your plan. Uh, your planned reuse that will help you move the property forward to the eligible end use, um, then by all means you need to be able to exercise that within your agreement. Um, another interesting thing I've seen in the field has been where lakes have partnered with academic institutions to work in phytoremediation or to use um, plant matter to deal with low levels of contamination on sites. Um, one nonprofit uh, that had a service learning component was working with uh, uh, high school students on a phytoremediation experiment. Uh, they came in and planted sunflowers and white clover on the sites that had low level lead contamination to see if they could actually, how fast they could start to mitigate some of those environmental conditions. The upside of doing that was you had a beautiful, a vacant lot that was filled with sunflowers and was being tended and cared for, um, and neighborhood residents came to value that property not just as uh, the elimination of you know the lighted uh, structure that was on the property. It became something that people thought aesthetically it was it improved the 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 streetscape and and made people feel really good about it. Uh, so it was kind of interesting as far as this introduce for that property. Um, public art uh, has also been um, a way that we've dealt with either parcels with structures on them and without. Uh, the Jersey County Land Bank at what point had a number of boarded, you know, they were properties that were boarded and secured and they were planned for redevelopment, but it was going to be roughly, you know, eight months before they could actually redevelop the property. Uh, an artist came in and painted the boarding on the windows and um, they were scenes of of habitants, of of curtains and fishing in, in the windows. Um, and it was, to a certain degree, considered public art because it was a vision of what these properties could be and should be. Um, another land bank in Lansing had a uh, structure. It was really the Skid Row Hotel of their community that had always been seen as a problem. Um, they, it was going to be maybe a few months before they could actually demolish the property, and so they decided to invite uh, graffiti artists from all over the Midwest to come in and graffiti pretty much every square inch of the building and this as a public arts project and raised awareness of this building and uh, you know what their intent was is actually to um, um, demonstrate that this was going to be a site for redevelopment eventually uh, and that it would be a vacant property which would be uh, made available for the eligible end use. Um, but it was just a creative way of looking at a pretty and how you can bring arts to it. So we're not just in this um, cookie cutter mode of uh, acquiring properties, doing basic maintenance and management, and then ultimately disposing of the properties. There's some innovation that can happen around it, which is really more community building. Um, as well, these vacant lots on an interim basis can be used for uh, neighborhood associations can do signage, they can do things that promote quality of life uh, for their neighborhood, and it's not just a vacant lot, but it actually has more intent on the interim basis. They're then reminding people that a lot of the bricks and mortar costs associated with this transformation are necessarily eligible to the NSP program, but this is also where you're engaging the key in what you're doing, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the importance of bringing the community into the interim use um, um, uh, of these properties so that you actually have something they value and they look at NSP as something beyond just providing affordable housing, but it should be neighborhood transformative. Um, back into uh, some HUD guidance which has been provided around maybe some of the trickier issues with the NSP program. Um, one question was how the bridge notice impacts the use of land banks, um, or use of land banks under NSP program. And in, uh, on June 19th of 2009, 
uh, NSP-1 Federal Register Bridge Notice uh, allowed for the establishment and operation of land banks for homes and residential properties that have been foreclosed upon. Um, this is was the basis on you know the, the initial verbiage that allowed for the doing land banking under NSP, which has then continued into NSP-2 and then NSP-3 as well. Um, can land banking include purchasing a foreclosure or abandoned property that has a structure on it, or does the property have to be vacant land? Uh, as long as it's been foreclosed upon, it can have a structure on it or be vacant land. The only time that you can't land bank with properties is if it's abandoned, and uh, then other um, eligible uses would have to be employed with a more immediate reuse of that property. How does a land bank differ from a land trust? Really, it comes down to uh, land banking is considered an interim activity. Um, banking is not supposed to be for ever and ever. Land trust actually can. You can land trust properties uh, as a permanent structure. But that is not what the NSP program is intended for unless you are... Um, using the land trust to create affordable housing. So, for example, the land trust could acquire homes or residential land from NSP funds, then build a new or rehabilitate existing housing and sell them to NSP-eligible home buyers while retaining ownership of the land. And the benefit here is that the exclusion of the price of the land keeps um, the homes affordable for a longer-term period. Uh, if the grantee buys property for the purposes of land bank under LGBTC and allows tenants to move in, we talked a little bit about that before. Um, uh, there again with the clarification from John that you would have to look at that maybe per share of the development uh, being maybe for the more restrictive requirements of the project. So if it's home funds, then depending upon the investment of the home funds, uh, may affect how much you can provide at 80 percent and then how much at 120 percent of AMI. Um, that was the answer to it. Okay. Um, this, it looks like we've got a couple questions that are queuing up. I know that I thought about doing uh, my questions a little bit later, but I wanted to maybe give people a chance to get some of these questions answered. Sure. Um. Let's see. Uh, David asked a follow-up question um, about his original uh, question about converting uh, to uh, community garden space. Uh, he asks, when you use uh, fair market value, do you mean an appraisal or HUD fair market value estimates for communities? I, um, I think we were we were really talking about on the resale. An appraisal, a fair market value assessment. There isn't a requirement for a, a formal appraisal, there, but uh, the expectation is that you'd have a, a professional estimate of market value for that property. That could be a, a broker price opinion, uh, sort of quality means to determine that that value. And it's important. I, I think we would certainly uh, certainly emphasize the use of an appraisal because it's a pretty important part of uh, redevelopment and, and how much subsidy is left in in particular property. I don't know if that answers the question. If anybody wants to add, add on to that, that seems pretty clear. Uh, so, John, uh, I mean, you don't need an appraisal to sell a property or to reuse it for something. So, uh, I mean, if you're going to use it for housing and then sell it to somebody, then you need. Uh, what the what the value is, but if you're going to take a one dollar tax foreclosed property and turn it into a community garden, you know there isn't a need for an appraisal to establish the you know you got a substantial discount from you know whatever it was worth. Okay. And, uh, I believe the. Uh, Carmen's question here was answered. Uh, she had asked um, to explain what you mean by side lot disposition and how it meets a national national objective if there is no housing on the lot, uh, but selling it to an adjacent property owner um, meets that national objective, correct? 
Let me tell you, Alan, um, there's a little bit of confusion, uh, even among the permanently confused Red HUD, about um, the distinction between land bank properties and other um, redevelopment. And so, uh, so, so let's let's ask Carmen's question directly first, which is that. Um, a housing, a side lot uh, for somebody else's home is still a housing use. That property is still residential property, and you can sell it or donate it or lease it or whatever you want to an income-eligible person, and it meets an income national objective, uh, LMMI. If that person, uh, for some reason, is above 120% of median, you could even lease it to them or, you know, make it available to them in exchange for, you know, maintenance. Uh, a, uh, on an easement basis or something like that. So um, the bigger thing, and that's, you know, kind of, I'm, I'm sort of hearing strains of this, is that um, properties are not included in the uh, Recovery Act language about redeveloping as housing. Um, only eligible use E redevelopment properties that are vacant or demolished are covered by the uh, by restriction to housing as a redevelopment use. So uh, link properties could be redeveloped as anything that meets a national objective under the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. Uh, obviously, you've got some restrictions on how you pay for some of those things, but I mean, with, with NSP, but you have other sources of funds, CDBG, general revenues, or whatever. Um, you, you, can, you, can, you have a lot of flexibility with what the end use uh, is. It needs to meet a national objective, um, but um, you know, lots of things do that aren't housing. Uh, let's go to Sandra now, who has a, a couple of questions. Sandra, where are you calling from? Are you there? Yeah. Um, yes. Hi. Hi, I'm sorry. I'm from Camden, uh, Redevelopment Agency in Camden, New Jersey. Great. Go ahead and ask your questions. Well, question, I, I picked up on uh, the re demolition. At, if I understand correctly, linking, I mean, SP2 funds cannot be used for demolition during the land banking period. Is Did I read that correctly? Well, they... The LGUC does not include demolition, but you can acquire property under eligible UC for use in a land bank, hold it in a land bank, and then demolish it with LGUC D if it's blighted. So the criteria for for uh, demolition are, are is um, the criterion is just that the property is blighted by uh, local standards. So assume you have that condition. Um, you can use more than one letter uh, on a property uh, in, in the NSP program, and it's not unusual for us to see uh, properties that go from, you know, that, that were acquired under perhaps B, and then they uh, they they demolish a house and they redevelop it under E. So you you have B, D, and E in there. So so it's kind of a technical um, distinction, uh, but you still could do it. I think that you may have answered my second question, which is. If a number of properties are being demolished and some part of the space is going to be um, open space and green and cleaned in this new development, um, would the demolition, would the demolition dollars still be uh, available for this? I mean, an SP2 dollars still be uh, used on, as an end use? Um, well, Potentially. So you have to. So in order to, be, to use demolition funds from SP, the property must be blighted. So if the properties you're talking about are blighted, then you can demolish them. Um, then the question is whether you've actually acquired it or whether you're just uh, demolishing some, you know, somebody's property. Uh, assuming that you've acquired it, then you have, uh, you know, you, you when you demolish it, you probably meet a national objective by removing a. Uh, there's building or improving the the, the neighborhood through a comprehensive uh, uh, program of uh, demolition, but you still have to meet a national objective for the acquisition. Um, so if the property was foreclosed upon and it qualifies to be in the, 
in a land bank, then you can do uh, a number of uh, redevelopment type things with those properties, including open space. Um, if it's, however, if it's SPU, as in your case, um, at least uh, one case that I'm aware of, um, uh, you can't use SP funds for the subsequent improvements or the, the open space or whatever it is. So if you're going to put some paths in or uh, something like that, you would have to find another source of funds for that. But that um, that end use could still uh, meet a national objective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. And let's, see, let's go to uh, uh, Christopher. Hi, Christopher. Yes, hello. Where I'm calling from the Adams County Housing Authority in Denver, Colorado. Um, my question was uh, related to, I think, uh, David's earlier, which was basically that if you acquired land, uh, let's say a large parcel, using um, land, uh, using NSP1 funds under the land banking activity, uh, but you subsequently disposed of a portion of that land, um, and you all the while contemplated a redevelopment of an affordable housing project on a portion of the property, could you recycle the um, program income from the excess land dispositions into the redevelopment project, or need to recharacterize it as a different activity? It sounds to me, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, that it, it would be development activity, so a, a separate activity, but, but um, certainly eligible. But you thinking about the program income from the disposition coming back in. Correct. Using those funds to redevelop, do, do some housing, do some affordable housing, uh, there would be any problem with re reprogramming those funds, but it sounds like, like the funds would be more uh, better used under a redevelopment activity. Yeah, this is John. You you could do that. So what are you selling the property for? I mean, uh, I guess that's the piece that I'm not getting. I mean, you can use those proceeds, but how are you using just selling it out of the program at fair market value or something? Or? Well, a portion of the property that is to be redeveloped uh, would be acquired using SP3 <laughs> Funds. It's kind of interesting because we we are we are acquiring more land than we were originally intending to based on the foreclosure and the need to control the site as opposed to the portion that we were trying to get. Um, so there would be a portion probably coming in right away displaced by NSP3, um, but it would be excess land that we would hope to sell within two or three years that could support a phase two development on this on this parcel that that we're planning out. Well, so excess land to use for what? So you go out to somebody else to, to housing, or correct? It's currently zoned residential. A portion of it's actually uh, mixed use, but overall, it's one large, large area that has 600 units on it, or is zoned for 600 units rather. Um, but we would dispose of the excess land. And hopefully, either of those funds would be program income that we then have to figure out what to do, or they could go into the second phase of development for multifamily rental housing. Well, I just want you to meet a national objective when you sell that property, or either that, or you follow the change of use. Uh, well, see, uh, you know, if, if you have a national objective with it in this place, then you need to make sure it's meeting a national objective. When you, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that disposing of it is going to get you there. Um, so, I mean, we, we need to talk a little more offline about this. But I mean, I don't have a problem with, you know, using program income to to uh, you know maintain or and or redevelop the property. I just want to make sure you've got uh, that doing uh, eligible activities all along the line, and that when you sell it, you're not um, you know set yourself up to uh, you know, that meet a national objective when you can no longer control the property. So, okay. Uh, is, there any, is there any way we could follow up afterwards? You could send a just a question into the uh, NSP um, 
resource exchange and the questions and and, and put uh, direct to HUD on it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, let's see. So there are still a, a few more questions lined up. Um, we could take them now, or would you like to keep going? Uh, maybe let's let's uh, we can continue through, and maybe okay. some of the uh, remaining conversation will help answer some of the questions. Very good. Um, when we were putting together the uh, the webinar, we started thinking about different case studies or examples that we could provide you about uh, organizations that are land banking and their kind of different markets that they're working in, and what kind of things resonated with them. Um, I've been working with an organization in Chicago, which is a uh, it's a, a large network of uh, community de community development corporations and affordable housing producers. Um, this office there in Chicago, uh, called the Resurrection Project, um, that was a really good example of a smart thinking organization. That is concerned with meeting eligible end uses, and their land bank portfolio of properties is fairly small. Or they want a land bank is not a substantial number. It's not like you see in Detroit or Cleveland or other markets. Um, <clears throat> but they um, have, their specific challenge is that the market is uh, it's challenging because of the cost of acquisition and construction. Where weak market cities, the acquisition uh, is not necessarily challenging. It's the redevelopment and the cost that they sometimes have to put into units. Um, this organization uh, recognized that they had funding for acquisition and demolition, and their plan was to use program income to pay for the redevelopment of these properties. But their question was, what happens if we get to redevelopment and market conditions take another dip like they have before, or maybe we can't sell the units as quickly as we need to, and they sit on the market for a longer period, and that program income doesn't materialize? Um, what do we do then? Uh, another question is, we're new to land banking, um, and um, how formal if we have a a portfolio of maybe 10 properties. How formal do we need to, to be? And how do we, how can we work smarter? Um, and then so uh, if they have to land bank for a longer period or something that goes longer than their three years that they have, um, are they going to maintain this in the interim? Taxes are extremely high in the city of Chicago, even on vacant lots. And for them to hold longer, uh, could create significant financial difficulty for the organization. So those were the, the technical assistance issues they came up with. Um, what the strategies that we employed for them was to, first and foremost, even with a small portfolio of land bank properties, you still have to have policies and procedures for land banking. And we scaled those policies and procedures to reflect maybe the smaller portfolio of properties or what their specific issues are. Um, they had first started working with a template of basic policies and procedures for land banking, um, but many of those things would have been sufficient for someone who is land banking 500 pro properties. And um, so we scaled those policies and procedures down to what their specific needs were. Um, and additional technical assistance is provided to the organization for a strategy in each lot. So that strategy um, coming into play when they look to acquire that property, uh, how they're going to treat that property during in the interim process. We had suggested some of these innovative uh, uses of the properties, the fighter mediation, um, potential on some of these lots, partnering with the university in Chicago, come in to actually do the testing uh, if there was any sort of contamination identified on the site that that could be a fighter remediation experiment and even if there was an interest there um, to work with the neighborhood association in uh, the, the trade area 
uh, maybe to do a sunflower garden because they're also concerned that they just didn't want vacant lots sitting there for any sort, any length of time, really, um, because those were typically the lots that would attract um, debris, that would attract dumping. Um, and so for them looking at how these opportunities for neighborhood building was really critical to them. Um, and most importantly, what they came up with was this idea of a three-tiered contingency plan for each property to reach the eligible end use. In the most ideal of worlds, their properties, uh, there was a quick turnaround or there would be a quick turnaround on the sale of those NSP units that were being completed under eligible use A or B, um, that those on the market funds would regenerate their pool of um, dollars that were available to redevelop, and they could self-redevelop. Um, contingency B, they always wanted to look at what was their plan for. Were the neighbors on either side uh, the income eligible to actually purchase that property? Uh, so that was a significant concern because in many cases, the amount that they're acquiring and they're demol demolishing for was significant. So the property would have to go to someone who is income eligible. Um, and then their third line of defense is actually having pre-existing relationships identified uh, with experienced developers or community development corporations that could actually step in and make sure that the eligible end use was met. So that may be partnering with a CDC locally that may have an influx of home funds that are available where these units could be redeveloped. So um, I like the direction that this nonprofit's going in. They're really hitting all the buttons of um, you know planning for properties all the way through the execution of um, uh, the the reuse of that property and each step along the way. So um, if you go back to that initial graph, which was established, they're really thinking about every step of that process. And I think from the small uh, organization with a small number of land bank properties to the large organization working potentially in a weak market city, um, that it is that um, continuum of thinking which makes their land banking strategy a lot more effective. That's my study discussion. Um, going back to maybe more of the the planning and um, organizing around marketing and disposition, um, I, I want to highlight in these community partnerships because some of the best work that's being done with NSP programs have these uh, these groups established that can help them work that process of uh, maintenance marketing onto disposition. Um, one example would be the NSP program in Pontiac uh, that is working in Pontiac, Michigan. That's in a very challenging environment. Um, they have a target area, which is one of those tipping point neighborhoods. Um, uh, but it, given the, the the foreclosure crisis that's happened, you know, it's kind of tipping a little bit back in the wrong direction, and they're having to re-enthuse the community that this is a great place to live. Um, instead of working in a vacuum, uh, they felt that having these community building activities around their NSP program were critical to the ultimate marketing and dis disposition of properties. So we look at this in two light, two ways that the, this community partnership can help deal with these challenges of maintenance. Uh, they can also help them work towards marketing and disposition of those units which are are created uh, through the NSP program. So they've started a process of involving, first and foremost, the Neighborhood Association, partner development corporations, civic groups, faith-based institutions, universities, and even on to artists collectives and gardening groups. Um, this helped them to create new resources uh, for maintenance, um, new partnerships like the ones that we've talked about before, um, also about um, how you build community so that you have um, a livable neighborhood 
And so um, that's been something that at first they hadn't necessarily thought of because they were just working out the mechanics of the program. Um, but they've gone on to have a more sophisticated approach due to this community engagement. Um, some of the tools that they've used for to get people engaged and on board with what's happening have been through community newsletters, websites, social media. Uh, they're an active user of Facebook blogs. Um, they actually have uh, a newspaper on standby at all times to actually talk about the innovations uh, in our community with these vacant parcels where um, I think the biggest challenges land banks can have is that they're seen as just sitting on properties um, and making them inaccessible um, because our timeline looks a little bit different than the communities because we're trying to reach best and highest use and the community generally just looks at the property as something that is blooded and needs, needs to be removed um, or just moved on to some other end user. And we're trying to work more strategically with land banking. So by educating the community on what's happening with these properties, if you have an innovative use, if it's a clean green program, if it's an arts demonstration project, um, you're able to help the community understand what you're trying to accomplish and how you're trying to build a better community. Um, so again, I think back to the ethic of your land banking program, the opportunity to make immediate improvements before the end use is met. So, um, moving on, let me see. Uh, in order to develop the market for completed units, and this goes on to traditional disposition strategies, but this is where you are actively procuring the services of real estate development professionals or bringing them into your process to help brainstorm what these market opportunities are and how the market may be changing in your community so that you're able to adapt better to um, what the end use of that property will ultimately be and maintaining the compliance. Um, but also, uh, you look at how you're engaging your partner community development corporations or how you're, public, how you're raising awareness of what you're doing at housing fairs um, or other public events. Um, and then also that you're working with your local maybe institutions or employers to develop employer housing programs and working with your home ownership counseling programs to develop this pipeline of potential buyers. Uh, so I think these things are all really, really critical when you're doing your disposition planning and you're thinking about uh, how you're being market responsive and how you're actually going to ensure that when you have the eligible end use that there is an eligible end user in place. So at this point, um, maybe we'll break for whatever remaining questions are available before we move on to our next case study. Sure, let's do that. And um, I will go to Jolene, who's had her hand up patiently. Hi, Jolene. Um, I have two questions, and they're actually uh, related to each other. Um, so subrecipients of NSP funds and been the purchaser and manager of land bank properties. Um, we we work these properties with a network of local partners, and they manage redevelopment activities for us uh, through a ground lease agreement. And we were wondering, can our local partners be considered developers for the purpose of NSP and collect developer fees or contractor profit? Um, to develop these land bank properties? Uh, that might be better to make Michael answer that one. Uh, this is John. Uh, possibly, uh, could it, uh, if they're doing, uh, the, do they control the property? I mean, do they do they have site control and do they, are they actually developing the, the new structures themselves or? Absolutely. Um, I mean, you could have a developer to a, that's that's uh, you know hired by or engaged by a subrecipient. So you know, in, in theory, what you're asking is is uh, and uh, they can. I mean, you don't have to be a developer to get a contractor profit. I mean, we're not trying to you know drive people out of business. You know, they're allowed to make reasonable uh, fees or reasonable uh, uh, contract 
contractors, in, in addition to developers, contractors can also earn a profit. Um, it's not a developer fee, but um, you know we're, we're, we're expecting that they will uh, have, uh, you know, be making some money on these things. So uh, it just needs to be reasonable and competitive in your marketplace. So um, you can um, uh, uh, developers with a procurement process. Uh, developers can select uh, contractors without a procurement process, although they have to ensure the costs are reasonable. Um, and you know, a lot of times that happens through a some sort of a competitive uh, process. But most developers that I've worked with, you know, go to more than one contractor f for prices on uh, you know carpentry or plumbing or whatever. So um, so there's different ways to to achieve that goal. So um, you know, so chances are that you could set up uh, an arrangement that would that function that way. Okay. Are you part of the P2 consortium? No. Um, okay. Right, we're still using NSP1 funding and going to uh, program income. Do you have another question? Yeah, I did, actually. Um, we we're considering um, doing a land trust with NSP funds, um, but one of the I guess obstacles we're coming up against is uh, securing the affordability. We have a local partner who has redeveloped some sites and he wants to use them as rental units in perpetuity. And so what, I guess, is your best suggestion on securing affordability in a land trust situation? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I mean, I'm a fan of land trust as far as um, you know, there being really long-term propositions, and the way they work is to, for those who haven't worked with them, they take you, you put the land, you take the land out of the development cost equation basically, and um, and just lease the land to a purchaser of a home, and then every time they sell the home, they can sell it for what they get, but the land is still out of the transaction, so you're you're you know subsidizing the price by you know, 15, 20, 25, or more percent. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess it would, you know, I guess, you know, sort of t to take it as narrowly as possible, you would probably want to look at, um, you know, the say you do with any uh, subsidy in a housing deal and, and calculate the direct subsidy to uh, the home buyer. And, and so in this case, let's say the land's worth, Ten thousand dollars, and and you're going to take that out of the equation, um, and and they're paying full market value for everything else. So so then your affordability period is based on that ten thousand dollars. That's this is how I'm thinking about it. I mean, I don't know that home has a has a sort of calculation for uh, uh, land trust. To, you know, so I, I hope I'm not stepping out of bounds here, but. Uh, but so I think the way to you know sit down and, and analyze well what what are you actually putting into these units as opposed to or if a rental you know how you know what's that subsidy uh, and then match that up with the minimum home affordability periods. If your developer wants to do things you know longer than that, they're certainly uh, welcome to do so. You just have to make sure you're meeting the minimum number, and and that you know that keys off of the direct subsidy per unit. Okay. You know, in a question, once you kind of have your your head around the numbers and send us a question and, and, and test it out. Sure. Will do. Hey, Lorraine. I was actually, you know, we're we're playing with this right now. Uh, it's a, a close out that we're writing, and we were just speaking with Yolanda this morning, and, and you know, we're actively trying to understand you know, this is going to work and come up with uh, a, a feasible set of closeout uh, instructions for uh, NSP2 or NSP grantees. Um, and one of the things, you know, that makes it difficult with land banks is you don't really know what, what the redevelopment uh, use might be, if anything. And, uh, you know, we've got this 10-year uh, period out there. So, you know, one half, we're trying to create some ways for people to meet the requirement without 
uh, creating like you know phony plans or phony uses or not phony, but I mean just sort of aspirational you know uses as opposed to something that's really possible uh, just satisfy uh, a closeout requirement and um, so you know, committing land to open space by you know giving it to the parks department you know might be one way to do that or um, my you know my idea one of my ideas was to, to put the land into a land trust, and, and, and there you are ensuring that whenever it's redeveloped, it will be redeveloped in, a, in an affordable way, uh, but you're not really lending anybody to, uh, you know, 10 years or 8 years or something like that. So uh, I think we see we see trust as kind of falling into two categories, those which are temporary uh, and will put themselves out of business and one which are uh, much more long term um, uh, and, and have you know are connected to you know structural uh, economic changes like you see in Detroit or someplace like that where uh, basically we just don't know what it's going to look like in in ten years you know and maybe in thirty years plus ten years so um, to create some flexibility for those situations I think for the for the shorter term land banks it's not going to be that big of a problem. It's just a question of when the market comes back around. So, uh, Marge asks the question, is rehabilitation under eligible UC permissible as part of disposition? Well, it's not part of LUC, but again, you don't have to, you're not limited to one letter per, per property. So, um, you know, if you if you acquired, let's say you acquired a land a pretty that you weren't sure what to do with, it was foreclosed. You put it into a land bank, or you transferred it in from a tax foreclosure, and sat there for a couple of years, and then you realize, hey, this thing's got some potential. This particular block is actually, you know, there's some developer interest, and and we could sell it. Um, you can make that structure under eligible use B or under eligible use E if it's vacant. And, um, and sell it off that way, and that's perfectly fine. And let's go back to, uh, one thing to uh, David. And uh, David, are you in Texas? Uh, yes. Very good. And uh, go ahead with your questions. Um. I'm putting a bunch of them, trying to go back to see what I've got. Uh, this one, uh, one of them is, if NSP1 funds are used to purchase land bank properties, and NSP2 is used to build new homes on those same properties, um, which rules would determine resale value and developer fees, if any? Uh, I don't think there really aren't any differences in those two sets of rules between uh, one and two or three, uh, the, the the resale rule in NSP one that you can't sell a house for more than the lesser of. You know I mean, we also went out. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I'm saying it's going back to the basics. All right, good, John. Just some background noise. Okay. Um, so, uh, so your 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 sales price is limited to total development cost or appraised value, whichever is lower. But um, that's true in all three versions uh, of the program. And um, uh, for the other one that you mentioned, but there really isn't any difference on that one either. So, um, so I don't think you're you're constrained. I mean, there's a few places where going from a program to another might. Uh, might turn up on you, like in terms of redevelopment, but um, I don't think uh, I have a problem with the examples that you gave. Okay. And I did have one other question that was related to uh, long term holding costs. Um, I think that, that example recently where you're looking at holding properties well beyond the grant period, uh, we're probably going to be in the same situation for some of our properties. And can we include? The sort of non um, non recoverable home costs, taxes, insurance, and other things, in the the eventual sales price of a property uh, in the future. Oh, 
Um, you can you can those directly out of the grant or out of the program income, but you cannot include them in the in the cost of the property or the sales price. And, and that's been that was in the original NSP one notice and hasn't really changed. So um, I mean, the idea that you're not really adding anything there. So I mean, you know, you, you want to sell a house or uh, or a building, you know, you, you you're safe the value in it. Um, just money into a building to uh, to keep it in the same condition isn't isn't changing the isn't changing the value in any way, uh, and so our uh, our notice was limited uh, it in, in that way, and and we have not changed that. So it is an eligible cost; it's part of disposition, but it's not a cost that you can pass on in the sale. I guess I'm confused about that. So. so we buy a property for five thousand dollars. We hold it for six years. And we have an additional five hundred dollars of costs that we weren't able to recover through grant funds. Could we charge fifty-five dollars for the property and recover it through program income? Well, I mean, normally our rules apply to to a house that's being Sold for someone's residence, but um, I think that I think that, yeah. But I think the sale homes language says still says that in determining the sales price limitation, HUD will not consider the cost of boarding up, lawn mowing, simply right. maintaining the property in a static uh, static condition. So uh, it doesn't really say it doesn't differentiate between a vacant lot and a. a uh, in a home, uh, in that sense, um, and I think the problem that you're pointing to is one that a lot of land banks are, are uh, looking at down the road, which is, you know, the grant funds are going to run out at some point, and the premium income may or may not be there, but we still have these maintenance costs, and, and unfortunately, the NSP doesn't have a doesn't have a great answer for you there, you know, except stretch your funds as far as you can, and is that an alternative? yeah. Find alternative sources, but um, yeah. it's, uh, it's it's maintenance doesn't make the property more valuable. Right. So right. saying that maintenance doesn't make the property more valuable, it just makes it not as valuable, hopefully. But um, okay. so, again, so you can you you can use funds as long as they last, but you know we we recognize that that's uh, that may not be long enough. Thank you for those questions, David. And uh, that's all of folks in the queue at this moment. So uh, let's take this opportunity to turn the ball over to Bill Whitney. Hi, Bill. Thanks, Ed. Um I'm going to go through about four slides and then have Mike Schramm, our IT director, quickly talk about some of our databases and systems. The Kai County Land and Reutilization Corporation, or CCLRC, was born with the foreclosure crisis, hit Koga County and our main city, city of Cleveland, uh, very early and very hard. Uh, after a couple of years, the required stabling legislation that we needed was passed in December 2008. Various required actions were undertaken by the kind of Koga County government throughout the first half of uh, 2009, we opened our doors in July of 2009. We're a profit community improvement corporation with a board of trustees appointed by various government officials. We are part of county government, but we use phrases like quasi-governmental or agents of the county to describe us. Banks have been around for a long time, and we modestly describe ourselves as a and bank on steroids. We have at domain powers, which is good, but we have a lot of very uh, positive traits that enable us to transact real estate activities quickly and efficiently. One powerful being that we have an annual budget of seven million that comes from a portion of the penalties and interest rated from delinquent property taxes. In December of 2010, this enabled us to go to the bond market and generate about $9 million from the sale of tax-exempt bonds. While most of 2009 was spent getting set up, hiring staff, establishing uh, policies, procedures, 
protocols with the county government and our 59 municipal government. And as P2 playing program nine. In 2010, we were up and operating at a very fast pace which has continued to grow by leaps and bounds every month. This slide shows our major source of acquisitions. The majority of our acquisitions are low value properties need demolition that acquire through very important bulk purchase agreements that we have with both HUD and Fannie Mae. And we get a large number of properties through tax foreclosure. Currently getting about 20 to 30 properties each month from each of these sources. These value acquisitions, coupled with extensive demolition activity, set up uh, code enforcement work by our municipalities, a very aggressive housing court judge in the city of Cleveland, and major prosecutions of flippers by our county prosecutor, have a major dent in widespread real estate flipping that was going on before our creation. This slide shows some of our activities to date. Sixes are changing daily, of course. Acquisitions, 1650. Uh, 200 pending transfers, again, mostly from HUD and Fannie Mae. We've flushed 825 properties. The vast majority of our demolitions are properties we own, but we have also undertaken 115 nuisance abatements. Those are condemned blighted structures that our municipalities ask us to intervene in. That's transferred 530. The vast majority of these are transferred to the city of Cleveland. The city of Cleveland has uh, had a land bank since the late 70s. Many municipal land banks only takes vacant lots, does not take structures. So our end of understanding with the city states that after we demolish properties uh, in the city, we transfer the vacant lots to them. 75 uh, rehab candidates. Some of these are uh, NSP2. We'll talk about that in a minute. Other done under a few different uh, rehab programs that we've developed. We do some in-house rehabs with our corporate money. We also have rehab programs where we work with both nonprofits and for profits, setting certain standards and safeguards to ensure that the properties simply aren't flipped. Shout that uh, a lot of the 550 properties uh, shown up as uh, other inventory are also in some stage of the demo process. Here, a quick overview of our NSP2 funding. Anank is the lead member of the consortium, which also includes the City of Cleveland, the County, and the Metropolitan Housing Authority, and approximately $41 million. And the slide shows the budget and the responsible parties for each of the programs. The fund of the first program, we call it Investor Loan. They're probably used for your traditional acquisition, rehab, and resell through third-party developers. The seat of Cleveland in Cleveland and the county in the suburbs use funds to continue and expand upon their NSP1 funded investor loan programs. One twist with the uh, two and two million dollars you see under the CCLRC in the investor loan was uh, to fund some multifamily projects. Most of the programs we have are demolition deconstruction activities undertaken primarily by the city of Cleveland within Cleveland and by uh, us in the suburban communities. Uh, all of the uh, Cleveland's demolitions are nuisance abatements, while as I mentioned earlier, most of ours are for closed uh, blighted properties that we own. The list, we have a small amount of funding under our land banking line items, acquisition, mothballing, the vacant reuse, uh, vacant lot reuse side yard program called land reutilization, and finally the Metropolitan Housing Authority and the city on projects under the 25 percent set aside. Turn things over to our IT director, Michael Schramm. Let me mention just a few 
quick examples of how the consortium members work together, and I kind of call these examples our best practices. Um, our housing market, not just in Cleveland, but in our inner suburbs, uh, the market is still real tough here. For both Cleveland's and the county's NSP1 rehab programs, it was very difficult to get developers involved. Finding suitable properties, the very pressed market, of course, dealing with various compliance issues were all major obstacles. With our nation, we own a good amount of properties in NSP2 target areas that we've acquired through our low value acquisition programs. We make these uh, we make developers aware of these in our eligible um, target areas through a website database. Uh, we also donate these properties to the NSP to developers, and we do all compliance. They, both our nonprofit and for profit developer partners, really love us for this. We've been able to stick about 50 properties into the city and the county's investor loan program. And we've all been able to uh, donate a number of properties to an NSP2 funded 25% set aside scattered site low in tax credit program. The second example is that we've been able to acquire and demolish units that were then transferred to the Metropolitan Housing Authority for some of their 25% set aside projects. And as I mentioned earlier, the city of Cleveland. Uh, with the City of Cleveland, the land bank acquires and polishes bright properties, transfers them as vacant lots to the city, and the city plugs them into the NSP2 funded vacant lot reuse program. Turn things over to our IT director. We cannot emphasize enough the importance of a good database system for organization of our size. Uh, working with various funding sources and its partners. Mike? We really use three types of information systems here at the Cuyahoga Land Bank. The first would be the analytical type systems. Uh, many of you may have heard of our neo can -Do system here in Cleveland developed by Case Western Reserve University. With a lot of input as to um, how, it gets, how it's developed, the different sources. And this is really the merger of many administrative data sources like foreclosure, sheriff, auditor, treasurer, land bank, et cetera, city demolition. We will maintain a finance and accounting system that has the ability to mark every single transaction involving a property with the actual parcel identifier and associated with a fund through a fund accounting system. So basically, at moments, at a moment in time, we could basically tell you which properties have had NSP2 charges and are those charges, whether they be for field servicing, demolition, asbestos service and abatement, et cetera. And we maintain a uh, property and project management database called our property profile system, which is really all of the different statuses for our particular properties. Our contractors engage with the system to allow them to upload photos. We have the ability to create reports such as what are the properties in our inventory that fall within NSP2 areas. Um, there is the ability to automatically create documents because we need things like demo specs, inspection forms, things like that. All information gets into a database and at the push of a button, uh, we can uh, basically basically produce all of the relevant forms necessary for compliance and other purposes. Um, one of the things that we have done through our property profile system is it allows, um, as the statuses change internally, they change externally on our website, as well as, like I, as Bill said, allow the developers to get a sneak peek at what's coming into our inventory in SP2 target areas. And the other thing we have done in our property profile system is tie in the new can do data directly as well as the financial edge data. So you basically have one place that our staff can go to to um, basically find out all they need to find out about particular properties 
either entering our inventory, in our inventory, or leaving our inventory. All we have from Cleveland, we'll be looking forward to your uh, questions if you have some for us. Terrific. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Bill and Mike. And uh, we'll, uh, there are no questions yet, but uh, there are, people may think of those. And let's go now to, uh, to Michael Freeman. Uh, he'll do a conclusion, and then we'll have a, a longer Q&A session. Uh, you know, during this webinar, I think we've talked a lot of, about a lot of pertinent issues, um, process-related issues. Um, you know, I think that what Koga is doing is just outstanding with property maintenance and their their acquisition planning, as well as um, just how they're turning their portfolio, because that's the thing that I think scares me the most. Um, is that longer term, um, how are we going to make sure that each unit which was impacted by NSP funding will actually um, reach its un eligible end use and everybody will happily be able to close out their files because they've got 100% compliance with HUD. Um, I, I think this all goes back to, for me, strategic thinking and acquisitions and asking yourself some very core uh, questions when you're convening people to figure out what properties are, are being targeted for your land banking program. I think that this is a ready-made list that you can actually uh, use as your conversation around what you're acquiring. And I think that you want to look at the property have strategic importance. Um, who at table is making that determination? Is this is one person within local government? Is it one person within your land bank or you know your your nonprofit who decides what is being acquired, or is this convened thinking around what is the best uh, position target? Is this ultimately part of a planned development? And hopefully, if it's part of your NSP program, it actually is part of a planned development area. Um, are you strategically bank properties, or are you just parking properties to hold on to it? You're not quite sure what's happened, or do you actually have a plan of action for the individual property? Uh, have you established what the best and highest use of that property is going to be? Um, and furthermore, how complicated or speculative is the future use? Best and highest use, community expectation, they want something that by the time you reach redevelop that property may not be feasible. So do you have alternatives listed within what consideration is for best and highest use? Um, and then the most important thing is how are you going to maintain uh, the property past the grant period? How do you keep the property from becoming a detriment, becoming you have demolished the blighted house which was on that lot and cleaned it up for the grant period? But if it falls back into um, without management, if it is now a place where people are dumping, you're actually going to see conditions and surrounding properties worsen. And so essentially your planning has to be part with that main strategy. Back to the questions from before, um, this year you may be able to engage your community groups in this longer term thing and paying for that maintenance, uh, I mean that you will have no money, and you may accru you may have additional costs that come out of your own pocket that you may not be able to reimburse uh, later on. Uh, your best course action is that support from the community who is benefiting from your blight elimination program. Um, implications of long-term land banking, uh, like Cuyahoga said, um, you know, it's critical to be able to maintain all of your files and records on each property. Every every property that was that have benefited from the NSP program needs to be tracked. And assume that over the time period, even if it's three or four years, there can be a transition within the organization. And so you have to have a good system of tracking every single expense so that you know, and then in the future they will know so that they can make, maintain compliance with the program. Um, and I think most importantly, that you maintain this plan B or plan C, and that you ensure that 
endpoint, you will be able to close out that grant within the required period, hopefully well before that 10-year period takes place. Uh, making sure that you've got your compliance strategies at all to, like, if you're using program income, that your plan B or plan C will uh, include the low-income set-aside requirements um, and, and the other requirements that are associated uh, with the funding sources that come in that you're able to meet that. So I think that th they're just my, I guess, in words of wisdom that when you're planning uh, your SP program for land banking that you actually have a firm strategy in place from the day one. And those land banks that I've seen which have just maybe hazardly decided that, well, we don't know what we're going to do with it now. We're just going to put it into our portfolio as a land bank property. Those are the ones that end up having the most problems longer term. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, uh, well, I don't know if anyone else has any words of advice or uh, thoughts that they would want to share as a conclusion as well. I, I think this would be a good time to add that. Other presenters? A good job, Michael. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think we can go ahead and move on to any final questions or um, uh, comments from the participants. Terrific. Uh, let's do that. And a reminder of how to ask questions. You can uh, the a written question. You can raise your hand. All those methods work. And uh, let's go to um, Marja, who has been waiting patiently. Marja, where are you calling from? This is not Marja. Her voice is not this heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Lewis Parks with the Detroit Land Bank Authority. I'm here with members of Cloudburst and uh, uh, Marge is with the Planning and Development Department. And uh, Brian Watkins is, is here as well as Andre Wallace. Um, need some on disposition. The, the land bank has inventory in NSP1 ready to be sold as is. So some guidance on, on what restrictions apply. Um, be they change of use restrictions or other restrictions. As it relates to the definition of disposition, <clears throat> will a rehab permit it? Uh, if not, why not? If so, what was that level? Just with those two questions, then we may follow. Who would like to take those? John, perhaps? Yeah, let me start with the rehab. Um, so, as I was mentioning earlier, you, you can do rehabilitation. You just can't put it under eligible use C. So if you bought a house and it's been in the bank for a while, you can uh, treat it if, you know, as long as it meets the requirements for, um, as long as it's the requirements for uh, your redevelopment or, or um, eligible use B, in terms of the type of property it was, uh, then um, those properties can be uh, renovated and sold, you know, out of, out of the land bank, and that's certainly you know what we hope will happen in a lot of cases. Um, so, you know, as we say, well, you can't do it under C, or you can only do demolition under D, but that doesn't mean that y you can't do it under NSP. It just means you can't do it under that legislative description of the activity. Um, as far as selling property as is, though, I'm not quite sure what that means. Uh, you know, you have to meet a, an objective if, if you own the property in the land bank. And so you'd be selling it for something. Um, and um, so if it's just kind of for whatever, then I think you probably have uh, some more you know, playing to do there or something because I, I don't think that's enough to you know, just sell out uh, of the land bank is you know get rid of it. But I think the last part of your 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 or your response about more I can understand the question. What's the use of that land? The use the the, the condition of it is as is, but what's it for? Talk about I think a single family 
inventory that we purchase under UC, we have to dispose of. We believe, and we actually have an FAQ from HUD dated July 26th of 2010 that was set under UC. Uh, we can do rehab, so it's a little confusing. How do you find disposition? Um, well, what was included under disposition in the in the regulations, the CDB regulations, is that maintenance and static, you know, condition type of thing. What I said that you can do. You can't do it. What is this mothballing? That is position also. It was it's a little high level than maintenance and preservation, correct? Well, um, I'm sure you got a better understanding of it than I do. I I don't you don't know where to draw that, that line, but it, if it's something that's not adding to the value, In the preservation brief. That's where I draw the line. Um, well, I'm saying do it. I'm saying you can do rehabilitation. I'm just saying it's not part of eligible use C. It's part of eligible use B or part of eligible use E. Um, it's hard to believe you have any properties that wouldn't qualify under one of those uh, categories. But if you look at the, the, you know, the, the notices on this, eligible use C is land banking. Uh, only so it's it's acquisition and disposition uh, as defined in C the CVG rules. It's not rehabilitation, but you do rehabilitation under one of these other uh, eligible uses. So I'm I'm, I'm saying you can do it. Um, I'm not sure about is when you talk about selling property as is. Um, I don't know what it means exactly. I mean, is somebody going to use it for something? And how soon? And, and yeah, yeah, we have some properties that are in, in fair enough condition that they can be sold as is. They were, we were fortunate enough to acquire them before they had been trashed. And, and they're, they're in livable condition. Oh. So there are structures on them and meet codes? Well, the question that I think I posed in writing was uh, to what level are we talking some HQS level that we would submit? Before we sell them, or can they be sold as is, or or criteria apply? Well, like, you have to meet a national objective with these things, and and typically that's going to be housing. If the property is not habitable according to local codes, then it can't really be considered to be housing. So, I mean, you can you can imagine a path to creating that housing that meets it that you know that is uh, habitable under local uh, codes but if there's something that needs to happen in between then you have to find some way to provide for that uh, you can't just sell it off and hope that it happens Michael Freeman too I guess as far as what you attribute your cost to let's say if there are slight modifications to help that property or house meet uh, the the local code. Once build the build the eligible cost uh, of the land banking activities under C, and then just any cost like if it requires a new roof, uh, a new heating system, uh, why isn't that just build to the redevelopment of that property? I mean, why do you want or need to build everything under land banking? You don't want to avoid having to restructure and sub recipient agreement. You want to take advantage of the breadth and scope of the definition of disposition. Save time. I don't want to go through the hassles of trying to get city council um, to to get on board in a timely manner. Well, sure, this is John. I, I mean, uh, you know, we have sort of strict requirements on when things have to go to City Council, I'm sure you do, but uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure we can avoid that. But um, you know, sh shifting activities around, sort of, bu you know, and if budget changes uh, aren't necessarily amends. Um, now, if I have to amend a, a subrecipient agreement, um, uh, you know, I don't know if that's got to go to your city council, but but um, but you can't define rehab into disposition. 
often is what it boils down to. So if you if your agreement says you will do land banking, that's all you will do, and now you want them to do rehab, then you need to change the agreement. Um, and I see, you know, an easy way around that. I mean, from our standpoint, it's you could just, but from your standpoint, and that has to go to the city council. Hello, Andre. John, um, here's, here's the question we sent in. We sent back received a grant for land banking activities under eligible activities. And can bank any funds be used to finance rehabilitation of properties to provide the subsidies to dispose of properties acquired with NSP funds? And you grant funds that were designated under eligible use C can be used. Own purchasing and maintaining or disposing of foreclosed upon home. They can free land and property or non residential property financing, rehabilitation, or development subsidies to be done on LWC. If the land funds are being used to rehabilitate and provide development subsidies to dispose of the land and properties, it would constitute financing for maintaining and disposing of the property. A grant for land banking activities can be used to cover rehabilitation and provisions of development subsidies for non land bank properties without amendment to the NSP activity. It would be easy for the grantee to negotiate with the uh, prospective for the innovative house. So I want to get some clarity on what the response actually was. Well, I mean, I didn't remember. I don't didn't hear every word of that. I mean, you know, it's like we were saying that you couldn't do rehabilitation under land banking. Um, sometimes we're not as clear as we ought to be about how you do these things. Um, you know, you have an, an approved rehab. If you have rehab approved under B or E, um, you know, we've been flexible in sort of shifting those around. Um, but you still can't do rehab under C. So if that's what you think we said, then we're wrong. Okay, because you said, you said if the land bank funds are being used to rehabilitate and by development subsidies to dispose of the land bank properties, it constitute financing for, quote, retaining and disposing of the property, period. That's well, what said. I think that what we understood you were asking in that case was whether you could do some, you know, board up or uh, you know, some some kind of minor type of rehabilitation, not not rehabilitation sufficient to make a, an uninhabitable home habitable again. Um, but uh, is this NSP one funds that you're talking about, or? Uh, yes. Okay. So um, so I think you know maybe the clerk's folks can help you. You you know work through what sort of local process you have to go through. I don't think from our standpoint it would be particularly complicated. I don't know what all your list of activities was in NSP one. Do you have uh, rehab? Do you have eligible use B? Do you have eligible use E? Do you have anything in those line items or? or do you It's, it, yeah, it's, it's hard to hear. I, I would I would suggest that uh, we, we've gone a little over time, and that uh, there may be some details here to work out that are specific to uh, what's going on in Detroit, and uh, that you have this conversation offline if that's okay. Um, but, but we do appreciate the question and hope uh, you can get to a, a reasonable conclusion uh, with that one soon. And let me just. Uh, Tells, um, what a couple of things that are available uh, on the NSP Resource Exchange. Lots and lots of information there. Uh, the Resource Library, uh, FQs, uh, training materials, including the uh, uh, archives of uh, webinars and uh, recordings, and, and lots and lots of activities going on the Resource Exchange. So try it out when you get the chance. And you probably are pretty familiar with it already. Um, Ken, if I could just, uh, uh, I did 
past my slide, unfortunately. Um, and a great uh, resource for everyone for land banking. Uh, you can see, let me see, slide 44. <clears throat> is um, this is a complete and comprehensive resource package that provides information on acquisition and disposition, process maps, legal forms, financing techniques, policies and procedures, boarding and maintenance specifications, and RFPs. It's a great resource, and I know a lot of people have been using it, but I definitely think that that would be one that would be helpful for you um, in moving forward with your land making program. So I just want to make sure everyone saw the HUD website and uh, the hyperlink is there, and uh, I invite you to use it. And uh, we have a question here, Lana, um, and if you, do you have a, a moment, folks on the panel, we can go a little bit longer. Uh, yeah. asks, on a foreclosed property that has not sold, would a sponsor need to move a property into a land bank, or could it still uh, sit under use B? As a term use, the property is being used by the CHODO rather than leaving the property vacant. Uh, well, uh, from a HUD standpoint, you could you do that um, if you have a use. I mean, I would still consider that to be land banked and you have the property rented as an interim use. Um, normally, properties that are acquired under B or, or, or vacant properties that are, that are acquired under uh, multiple use E, we're looking for those to be developed or redeveloped within a couple of years. Um, you know, there are, in fact, I think going to be quite a few properties that, that don't um, that move uh, far enough in, in that direction fast enough, and unfortunately, they're not all going to be foreclosed upon properties that qualify for land banks. So, um, we are uh, trying to come up with some things uh, on how to deal with those, uh, what I'm calling orphan properties, the ones that uh, are not eligibly join a land bank. Um, but since was foreclosed, um, I mean, you know, it's not really you're not really doing activity B by renting it out uh, temporarily. You're doing activity C. So I think that makes more sense as a as a land bank. Um, you know, if you had acquired that property though, or um, you know, Chota has it and and ha and plans to rent it for for the long term, uh, or could rent it for the long term, um, you know, maybe you could just transfer. Ownership, uh, you know, at least for you know a certain number of years or something like that. But um, I don't think it's a problem as you describe it. But I think there are any number of properties out there that uh, don't have an immediate future and uh, and don't qualify for a land bank either. Uh, ones we're kind of worried about now. Thanks for sending that question in. Well, uh, let me show you all what's coming up. Uh, three more webinars on this right now, and uh, don't know uh, if Hunter got more in his uh, basket after that, but that's what's scheduled now. And then the final one in this uh, four-part series is a week from today, and a peer-to-peer -to -peer exchange on uh, best practices of disposition. And uh, when you leave today, you will be. Uh, take automatically to a survey form. We appreciate any uh, comments you have for us. Uh, written comments are especially useful, but uh, if you take minutes to uh, to answer that, we'd appreciate it. And uh, I would like to. I see no more questions, and we are over time. So I'd like to thank all our panelists uh, and the whole slew of them that you see here today. I won't go through them all individually, but uh, thank you very much for your uh, time today. On, on this webinar and uh, helping to clarify what goes on with banks. And thank you very much, and thank you all for being with us today. We look forward to seeing you soon on another NSP webinar. Everyone. Thanks, Thank you.